For tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday morning, July the 9th, 2000. Final service of the summer family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dr. Bill Null of Salina, Kansas, is the speaker of the morning. Come, Lord Jesus, just come. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you and we glorify you, God. Let your anointing just come down in a, in a way, Lord God. Let your words be anointed as they go forth. For your words, Lord, they are life, they are spirit. Lord, let your spirit anoint these words, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Let them go forth. Let them be your words, Lord. Go down into the heart and bear crop 30, 60, 100 fold. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the brothers today talked to me about, uh, I had a uh, long, I just turned over all these pages, I had a long prepared talk, but this morning God said I should talk about something else. So y'all will bear with me as, uh, I said, how do you stay free? I wrote a book once. Uh, God gave me this book on conditions for deliverance or conditions for change. And I sat up every night till about four in the morning writing this thing for about six or eight months. And I had it written. I brought it down and had Brother Glenn read it and we talked about it. But I had the last chapter to write on how you stay free. And I wrote that one about eight times. And every time I wrote it, I got through and I looked at it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in a sweet little voice and said, that's real nice legalism. <laughs> and I, I start over again. And after the tenth time, I decided that God really didn't want me to publish that book. <laughs> that I had done that for my own edification to show me that the law doesn't set anybody free. Legalism, having a set of rules, doesn't set anybody free. All it does is put you in bondage. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So, that's John 8. So, Lord, today we're going to... I looked at the example of the Apostle Paul. And I think, first, let's go back to something Sister Irma told me 15 years ago. She told me that if I kept a clear conscience and if I would repent of my sin, that demons would flee. She said if we could get people to really repent and turn from sin, that uh, deliverance would be much easier. And I found that was true. Paul says in Acts 23, let's look at Acts 23 verse 1. When he's standing before the Sanhedrin before the high priest. And Paul, Acts chapter 23, verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brothers, I have lived in all good conscience before God this day. And the high priest said, Strike him on the mouth for that. And then Paul answered back to the, he said, God will strike you. You whitewashed wall, you stand there to judge me by the law and, and order me struck in the contrary to the law. And someone said to Paul, he said, no, you dare to revile God's high priest? And so Paul said in verse 5, <coughs> Brethren, I did not know, brethren, he was high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Paul repented immediately. Paul acknowledged that he was under authority, just like we are under authority from Bill Clinton. And we don't need to accuse Bill Clinton before God. The devil is already doing that much more effectively than we'll ever be able to. It 
says in oh Jesus, it says in Ecclesiastes. Oh, is that one? It says that in Ecclesiastes, verse ten. I mean, chapter ten. I'm sorry, verse twenty. Do not curse the king even in your thought. Now, God is the only one that knows your thoughts, the devil doesn't. And he says, don't curse the king even in your thoughts. Pray for him. And in First Timothy it says, I exhort you that first of all you should pray for the conditions of all men, for kings and all authority. You might lead a quiet and peaceful life. So every morning at prayer meeting we hold up our president. But my prayer partners and I, we hold up Bill Clinton every day. And I try not to ever say anything. I, if I get a bad thought about him, I, I push it out and repent of it. And I commend him to God because God raised him up. Now, y'all might not believe that, but that's what the Bible says. That all authority emanates from the throne of God, and he's there because God raised him up. The night before the election... The pastor and a group of elders, we were at a prayer meeting praying for the nation. They said, what's going to happen? I said, no. And I went home that night and I laid before God. And he said, the country's going to get what it deserves. And I wept all night. I said, God, give us grace. Don't give us what we deserve. Give us what we deserve. We've got Bill Clinton. And I just asked God to save him every day. Just to bring him to salvation. To bless him and his wife and his children. And to save him. Bring him to salvation. Fill him with the Holy Ghost and all the other people that are elected. I hold up the election now and ask God to raise up righteous men for us, but I will not criticize who God raises up. I'll pray for them. Doesn't mean I have to vote for them. You understand? <laughs> I vote my conscience. <laughs> London Johnson said that people, when the curtain pulled and you end the vote, he said, you will vote your pocket book. And, you know, I'm afraid that for a great number of people in this country, majority, that is true. They don't vote their conscience from God. They vote their conscience from the world, their pocketbook. What's good for me and mine? What's going to be the best thing for me and mine financially? How are we going to prosper best in this world system? And that's the man I'm going to vote for. I say it. It took... London Johnson, to say that. Let's look at, uh, at Acts 24, verse 16, where Paul further emphasizes, and here he is testifying again. And he said, starting at verse 15, Acts 24, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there is a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Now, this is, in other words, if your conscience convicts you of a sin towards God, you repent to God immediately and you place it under the blood of Jesus Christ. But if you have an offense towards your brother, what do you do? Let's look over in Matthew chapter 5. Hold your finger there in Acts, and let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 23. Here Paul is talking about someone being angry. And he said, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. And, and then verse 23 says, Therefore, if you bring a gift or an offering to the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come off of your gift. Agree with your adversary. Now he's talking about the, the one that you have the disagreement with. Quickly, while you're on the way with him, lest he turn deliver you to the judge, the judge hang you over the officer, and you'll be thrown in prison. Now, surely I say you will by no means get out till you've paid the last penny. And I always wondered about that. And I tried to make the adversary the devil. But God showed me that the adversary is the one that you've done the offense to. 
And if you continue with that offense and make no effort on your part, do all you can in good conscience to clear that offense, then this he will turn you over and you'll be put in God's jailhouse. The same jailhouse that they put the fellow in that won't forgive. And other translations called it the torturers and the tormentors. But it's the same place. That you and so you have to clear your conscience between four men and God. And you know, I, I, I talked to you the other day about my friend that whom I had offended and I went to him and I asked forgiveness and he uh, got in my face and shook his finger and told me he wasn't going to ever forgive me. And he was going to get even with me. He didn't forgive. He got even. And when he had his first knee replaced, uh, his first hip replaced, I, I went to pray for him. And he, and he and his family accepted my coming and praying and standing with him in prayer for his healing. And when he had his second hip replaced, I went to pray for him again. And he was heavy, and he was overweight, and his health was not good. And they were afraid he was going to die. And I prayed for him for his knees and for his hands. And I tried to settle it again. And he, he snarled. and said, I'm going to get you yet. Now, you know, I've made peace with that man. I have a clear conscience. And I weep for him. I weep for him. And I say, pray for your enemies. And so God says there, and he's a little further over in that chapter, in chapter 5 of Matthew in verse 42, it says, let's read it. It tells you how to clear your conscience. If they won't make it, let you make it right, then you just go to God. And don't complain to God about how dirty they've treated you. Ask God to bless him. Verse 43 said, You've heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good for those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be a son of your Father in heaven. And when you can do that and really label, I found that when I could really labor for that man in love, and and really, you know, just weep that he that 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 he would about this horrible arthritis and obesity and, and heart trouble he had and and the pain he was going through, that God would set him free. God's love was able to pour I mean I couldn't do that in my own strength because there was a number of things that he had done to in his process so get neighbor. And I gave those to God. I just gave them to God. And as I wept for him, God set me free. God set me free, people. I got a clear conscience before God and before him. I, you know, even though he's still in God's jailhouse and he's still suffering, and, and I pray that God will set him free, will have mercy, grant him mercy and grace. I pray for his children and his grandchildren because they suffer too. That her daughter died, left two orphan children. Oh, Jesus. Praise and bless and glorify you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Let's uh, look at Second Corinthians chapter 4, 2. Starting with verse 1. Therefore, since we have this, this ministry, as we have received mercy, do not leave heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We walk in love. We don't let corrupt communication come out of our mouths about other people. We walk in love. And we bless God and we praise God for Him. And my mother used to say, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. And that's a good that's that's in the Bible, in Ephesians 4.29. It says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Only that which gives grace. James says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and very slow to get angry. And if you do get angry, don't let the sun go down and settle it. Praise you, Lord God. Now, Paul had some instructions that he gave 
a young preacher named Timothy. Let's look at Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 and 5. 1 Timothy 1 and 5, the purpose of the commandments is love. Now, we've said in Romans that all the law is summed up in. Well, let's look at that. Keep your hand there in Timothy. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Oh, Jesus, where is that, Lord? You know, it says that all the law is summed up in love. Praise you, Lord. You love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. It doesn't, I kind of don't see it. It's in there, but it's hidden from me. I've got it marked. I must be looking over it someplace. It's also in Galatians chapter 3. Can you find it in Romans? We'll find it in Galatians. It's in Romans 13.10. Romans 13.10 says, Love does no harm. Romans 13.10 says, Love does no harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In Galatians 5.14, it says, All the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so we come back to 1 Timothy. 1, five. it says, The purpose of the commandment is love. From a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from, the, from, from, from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, and turned aside to idle talk. Desiring to be teaching the law, understanding neither of what they do or what they affirm. It goes on down to say the law is made for a very... You don't want to be under the law, people. You want to be under God's grace. You have to love. Now, you know, and I know, that Jesus Christ came to love the unlovable, to teach us to love the unlovable. It's easy to love. You know, the first time I heard it was when I was a heathen, and I was watching a, a play called Raisin in the Sun. And Big Mama was a black lady in Harlem whose husband had died and she'd received $10,000 insurance money. And brother, her youngest son, her son wanted to invest in a liquor store. And she just wasn't willing to put, let, put her insurance money in a whiskey store. And through a series of events, she finally just decided to give it to the boy. She said, but you take $2,500 of it. This is in the 40s now. And you take it and put it in the bank for your sister, because she's been accepted to medical school, and this money will put her, that money will put her through medical school, and you can have the other 7500 And she had bought a house out and served with part of it. So you can have what's left for the liquor store. Well, son got slicked out of all the money. The people who he was going to grease the palms and down in Albany and, and get the license and so forth, they stole the money from him. But they stole not only his, they also stole, stole sister's 2500 They had to have it all, you see. And sister didn't have any money, and she was fit to be tied. And she was going to get her brother when she got her hands on him. Big Mama said, Sister... The child, had you learned nothing? All I've taught you, had you learned nothing? It's easy to love your brother when he do you good. But the test of Jesus in your heart is to love your brother when he's done you bad. Now, you love your brother. We'll get you through school, but you love your brother in spite of the fact that he did you dirty and stole your money. And that stuck with me. And I said, man, is that what it's all about? Because that was not the way I was raised. Praise God. I won't go into that. But that stuck with me. And then when I got saved and I came to a realization of the gospel, I realized Big Mama was right. Whoever wrote that play was right. Those words coming from Big Mama says it is easy to love your brother when he's doing good for you. It's easy to love people that are blessing you. The test of Jesus Christ in your heart is to love the one that does you dirty and let the love of God pour out of you because you can't do it in the natural. 
but you let God's love pour through you. Oh, God. And acknowledge that you can't do it. You know, you can't walk this Christian walk in flesh. You've got to walk it in God's Spirit. So when you go, you walk it to keep a clear conscience before God and men. And how do you do that? If you commit sins, you keep short accounts with God. You place it under the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus. Yeah, the blood of Jesus. Let's look what it says about the blood of Jesus. Jesus, praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Let's look at Hebrews 9 9. Keep your finger in Timothy because we're coming back there in a minute. Well, let's jump over to Hebrews. Hebrews 9 9 said, talking about the Old Testament, Old Order sacrifices. It was symbolic for the present time in which gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who formed them perfect in regard to the conscience. It only, it concerned only food and drinks and various washing and fleshly ordinance imposed until the time of Reformation. And come on down to verse 12. Well, verse 11 said, Then Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not made with man's, that is, not of his creation, not with the blood of calves and goats, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once and all for having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without thought or blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by the means of death for the redemption of transgressions of the first covenant and those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That means that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse your conscience from dead works. When you commit a sin and you say and you get convicted before God, you know, you say something, I uh, got irritated during the last delivery service. There was a young man who was, came up here and was wandering around up in the front. And I got irritated, and I spoke sharply to him. And, you know, God convicted my conscience, and I stopped. I covered the microphone, and I apologized for speaking sharply to him. Although I thought he was out of order, but nevertheless, I spoke sharply to him over the microphone. And that was uncalled for on my part. And I had to apologize and ask his forgiveness. And I asked God's forgiveness, too, under the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse me. Because that did not edify, didn't build him up, and it sure didn't bear grace to me. It was uncalled for, for me to say something and embarrass him. I ask forgiveness and move on. That's a little thing. But you should repent. When you know you've done it, you should repent immediately. And say, dear God, and if you've offended someone, say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I offended you. Please forgive me. What can I do to make it right? It doesn't mean you've got to lay down and be a railroad, lay down that's about to run all over you time after time after time, but that you do as much as it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. That's Romans 12. I forget the verse number, but well, let's see what that is. Romans 12. Verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. As it is written, billions is mine, saith the Lord. 
The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you. Praise you, Lord God. Let's go back to Timothy now. Let's look at Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 1.19. Starting with verse 18. This charge I, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. Right. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Of whom Helimus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they learned not to blaspheme. But they rejected the clear conscience, and it caused them to shipwreck. If you get convicted, you don't clear your conscience, you can get shipwrecked. Look what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says, in a lot of times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing or deceiving spirits and doctrine of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What does that mean? That means that when you leave him, you're going to meet some people. Let's look at, uh, let's turn over here. Keep your finger there in Timothy. And let's go over to Second Corinthians chapter 10, 11. One of the young ladies that I was ministering to downstairs said, Dr. No, does the devil have access to God's presence? And I said, yes. He can change himself into an angel of light and go into God's presence. It says so in Job. And so this is the verse in. Look at second chapter, I mean second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse thirteen. Are such false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostle of Christ? And no wonder. For Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Well, how does that affect the teenagers? Well, I said, you know, you will go home. I said, you're good-looking young girls, and you're a real prize. And the captain of the football team, who may be president of the youth group over at the local Methodist Episcopal or Baptist Church, Good-looking young man, captain of the football team, and he'd just be so sweet to you, tell you he'd be a Christian, but you find out to be his girlfriend, you've got to drink beer with him and sleep with him. That's the price of you going out with the captain of the football team, who happens to be a good Christian boy. He is a minister of Satan, sent to bring around your downfall by the devil to entrap you. And he will speak to you lies and hypocrisy. And his conscience has been sealed with a hot iron because he doesn't feel what he's doing is wrong. He doesn't get any conviction in his conscience because he's walked in sin so long that the demon of deceiving demon has taken that hot iron and seared his conscience and that demon speaks through him to you. And if you listen to his lies, then he'll suck you in. And if you, and if you, when your conscience convicts you, it's wrong to drink that beer. It's wrong to be out heavy petting and being drawn into sexual immorality. And your conscience convicts you, but you put more faith. Your emotions are raging, and you are so, and you and you are elevated in your emotions because you are going with the good-looking captain of the football team, and everybody is saying you've been accepted by the in crowd in the school. That theme will sure see your conscience too. And the first thing you know, you're in gross sin and immorality and shipwreck, and don't even know it until suddenly you pay a terrible price. Now, the one thing about it is, God is gracious. He was gracious to me. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord. 
And He can heal your conscience and make it sensitive again and set you free. Because when you come to Jesus Christ, behold, all things come new. And when you come back to Him, He can cleanse you and restore what the caterpillar, the canker worm, and the palmer worm have stolen. And cleanse your conscience from dead works so that you can follow Him. But it's better. My daddy used to tell me that the school of hard knocks was a real good school. But there is a better way, son. There's an easier way than that. <laughs> and I said to those children, follow Jesus. In the end, it's easier than following the devil and then having to come back. And so, when you leave him, it may not be the captain of the football team that comes to talk to you. It may be the elder to church. He says, oh, now, come on, let's be logical and reasonable about this thing. You just got all emotional down there. You know that you are under the blood, that no demon can be in there with the blood. You just got all upset and emotional, you know. Let's be reasonable and logical about this thing. You know that that, that demons, that's an old medieval superstition. You're going to be talking about things go bump in the night next. Yeah, hadn't you heard them? <laughs> you know, the Episcopal Church used to have a prayer in their prayer book of an evening prayer and said, Good Lord, protect us from things that go bump in the night. <laughs> Praise! They, they took that out. Though. They took that out. You know. As the bishop of New York said, "We'll take out this reference about I renounce the devil and all the pomp and glory of this." Because so nobody believes in the devil anymore. And this evangelist, can you believe that? There he is sitting in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah, and says nobody believes in the devil anymore. Praise God. Great Sodom and Gomorrah has moved out of New York. That was 30 years ago. I'm afraid it's, it's sort of spread out a little bit now. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. Let's look at Titus 1.15. And here he is telling Titus to rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, and even their mind and conscience are defiled. They, possess to, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. Now, what's an abominable? An abomination before God is to fall after the occult, to follow after sexual immorality, and to follow after greed, to love the world, to love money, and not love God's creations or the people. Disobedient. What are disobedient? These are people who refuse to be under authority. I tell everyone that I counsel that they need to be placed under authority of someone. When I come here, I'm under Glenn's authority. And I will do what Glenn tells me to do. When I go home, I have a pastor and I'm under my pastor's authority. And I do what the pastor tells me to do. In regard to the church, I have a partner at the office who is my, who's the chief partner. And he and I, and I am under his authority. God says that all authority emanates from His throne. He will place an authority over you. And everyone has someone they answer to. And if you're willing to accept authority, you can get free and stay free. But you see people who are lone rangers, they say that they answer to God, that the Holy Spirit, Abraham, I can remember this, the lady who said, Abraham walked 13 years. He was out there by himself. I'm like Abraham. I see. That's when uh, that's when he uh, had a that's when he uh, fathered Ishmael, isn't it? 
That's when he went down to Egypt and told them that his wife was his sister. You know, a number of other things there. And he just sort of worn out. That's what you want to be? You don't want to be worn out in the desert and, and not have God? You know, you, you walk in just you and God. And God ain't talking to you. Mm-hmm. Beyond authority. She didn't hear me then, and I don't think she'd hear me now. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Hebrews 10. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 10:19. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil, and from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, pure water of the word, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling together as a matter of some. That means that you need to find a good Bible-believing church, one that believes in the Bible. And, you know, sometimes when you go back, you can't find one that's perfect. If you find the perfect one, it won't be perfect when you join it, after you join it. But find one that believes the Bible. And exhorting one another so much more as we see the day approaching. And so you hold on to the faith. You find a place of fellowship. You continue to be washed with the Word. And having your conscience sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, continually placing your sin under the blood of Jesus Christ. And living in love with all people, letting the love of God flow through you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hebrews 13, 18 says, Paul says, pray for us. We are confident we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably in all things. So have a desire to be honorable in all things, without reproach, and move forward. Some things that uh, you shouldn't do. Let's look at uh, back in Matthew again, in chapter 6, 33. And it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Uh, Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. And so you said, Well, all these things, what are you talking about? You're talking about money. Up here it says you can't serve God and money. That word manum is an interesting word. It originally came from the Greek as that which you put your trust in. That which you put Most people put their trust in this. Now I hold up a, well, it's a ten dollar bill. I don't have a dollar bill. Praise God. Yeah, hallelujah. Could say I put the dollar bill in the offering. But that's not true. But most people do joke about, you know, say, where the dollar bill, where you been? Oh, I've just gone from church to church to church. Put my dollar in the plate every week and five dollars on Sunday and Easter. Praise God. But you can't, you know, the, it says in First Timothy that the love of money is the root of all evil. It says in James chapter 4, don't love the world. To die to self, you have to die first to your to self pity. You got to die first self pity. Where does it say that? Well, I don't. I don't want to get into this. I'll be another hour and a half. And Irma's told me that, I, but she didn't want me talking past the noon. And I think that's good because I don't want to to try to talk too long. But let's look at Matthew 16. Here you're going to see that. If you look at Matthew 16, 16, Peter said, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, to Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, said, uh, Peter said that, I'm sorry. And uh, he said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't show you that. And then later on, he says, you know, now I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem. Let's look in verse 21. At that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and be killed and raised on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and said, Far be it from you, Lord, shall not happen to you. And he said, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You're not mindful of things of God, but of men. Then Peter said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny his soul, his self, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his soul life, his sukkah, his soul life, will lose it. And whoever loses his soul life for my sake will find it. For what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, here, Jesus said that your soul was worth more than the whole world. He said that you had, Peter was saying, have pity on yourself, Lord. You're not going to go down and let those people do all that to you. I'm not going to let you do that. He said, get behind me. I know what I have to do. He did not feel sorry for himself. He did in the garden in loud cry, said, Lord, there's not any other way, Father. He didn't. And he did not turn back. But he said, don't feel sorry for yourself. Be willing to deny self-pity. When something bad happens to you, hold it up to God, bless the people that did it, and say, I will not feel sorry for myself. I will not allow self-pity to come in. But through Jesus Christ, we shall overcome. For he said, I have overcome the world. In this life, offenses will come, but I have overcome the world. And so you push out to let Jesus show you how to overcome it, and you overcome it by loving. Now, we talked yesterday about making false coverings. Deciding how you're going to do it, how you're going to settle this offense, and, and making your plans without consulting God. And he said that was going down to Egypt, the world, and getting advice from the devil. And it's a false covering, and it's, it's idolatry, and you have to ask God to forgive you for idolatry and break the curse. So don't love the world, and don't feel sorry for yourself. And the last thing I want to say is, let's look at James 3.14. James 3.14. He says, if you have bitter envy or selfish ambition, do not boast or lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, soulish, demonic. Where envy and self-seeking confusion and every evil thing will be found. Don't love the world thing, or people or the things that are in the world. Don't love those. First John says, don't love the world or the things that are in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Don't love those things. Remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? Now, Lot, you remember, was a very wealthy man. He and Abraham became so wealthy that they had to separate out. They had so many herds. So Abraham went one way, and Lot went to, to Sodom in the beautiful, cultivated green fields in the valley. And he sold some of his herds, bought himself a nice house there in town, became an elder in the city because he was so wealthy. When the angels came to visit him, you know, to take him out of that place, and it says that they, he looked and it tormented his righteous soul, what he saw going on around him. And the angels came and they said, we've got to leave. And they took he and his wife and his two daughters by the hands. The, 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 the two boys that were betrothed to those girls wouldn't go. They laughed at him, thought he was foolish. And so they took Lot, his wife, and those two girls, and they, by the hand, and helped them leave the city. And they said, don't look back. But one day she got up to the top of the hill, 
she thought about all those nice things in her house. You know? And she didn't turn around to go back to get anything. She just looked back at them. Cast along and looked back. And she turned into a pillar of salt. That was done as an example for you today. To tell you not to look back. He says, once you put your hands to the plow, don't look back. You're not fit for the kingdom of God if you start longing and looking back. When you start longing and looking back at what you've left, start fantasizing about... Fantasy is a, is, is a horrible enemy. It's a way to escape reality. And when you do that, you invite in demons. You fantasize about sex, you will get sexual dreams. You will get an incubus or suck up a spirit to come to you in the night to violate you. Now, you all know what an incubus and suck up a spirit are? Incubus and suck up a spirit are spirits that have sexual intercourse with human beings. Sexual relations with human beings. It leads to depravity. It happens. I won't go any further into that. But if you don't want that to happen, don't fantasize. If you fantasize about money, greed will come into you, and so forth. Whatever you start fantasizing and, and making these air castles and talking to yourself about it, that's what will come in. Because that is demonic, soulish, earthly, soulish, and demonic. It has demon power. If you find yourself doing that, Push those thoughts out of your mind. Could be a demon whispering in your ear if you didn't bring it up. If you brought it up, then put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Confess it as sin before God and say, God, give me strength. And push it out of your mind. And start thinking of whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is pure. And so the last thing I say to you is, look at Philippians 5.4.4. 5, 5, 5, 4. Philippians 4.4, 4. Rejoice in the world always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord's at hand. Be anxious for nothing. In everything, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which patheth all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That word guard means to garrison. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good reports, any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and saw in me, do these, and the God of peace will be with you. People, so number one, when you leave, know that Satan will sin a minister of righteousness to you to try to deceive you, try to talk you out of it, and try to get you to renounce it. Number two, when you sin, put your sins under the blood immediately. And if you've got anything against anyone, or your brother's got anything, you try to settle it quickly. Keep a clear conscience between men and God. Keep short accounts. Do it quick. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't love the world. Don't love money. Don't love the world. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Die to self. Let self go. Sister Coffee talked about dying to self yesterday. Get a tape and listen to it. I've got a two-hour tape back there on dying to self someplace. Irma looked at me and said, You don't have mercy on anybody, do you? That night. We didn't get through till about 11 o'clock. Somebody said, you didn't leave out anything. So I said, get that tape and listen to it. You need to die to self. Having your conscience sprinkled with, with the blood and your body is washed in the pure water. Wash in the water of the Word. Read the Bible every day. The good studies that you can get to Guides that you can get to read through the Bible once a year, one, or the whole Bible in a year. You read three and a half chapters a day and you go through the entire Bible in a year. Read. Let God's Word come alive to you. 
Say, pray before you read and say, Lord, let the Word come alive. These words are spirit. They're life. Have them come alive to me, Lord. So that they mean something in my life. And He'll use those words to jump out and show you in situations that are going to occur that day. Or what occurred yesterday, and He'll make speak life to you. Praise God. And lastly, praise Him. Rejoice in the Lord. I have records that play in my house. I have a CD player that plays in my house, and it plays praise. It never stops. And I turn it up in the day and down a little bit at night so I can still hear it. The demons hear it. And one then in, in the other part of my house, I have the Bible on tape, and it play on, on CD, and it plays all the time. The word, I sanctify my house with the, with the Word of God. I don't own a television set. And I don't play rock music or, or, or secular music, but the peace of God settles in my house. I had some missionaries came through my house. And they, some, uh, they weren't missionaries either. They were evangelists. They were Christian song evangelists. And they came to our, to our church in the past. They didn't want to stay in a motel. And pastors asked me if they could sleep in my home, and I said yes. But you know, I don't cook any of that, Pastor. I'll take them out to eat one night, but you're going to have to feed them. They said, fine, we'll feed them at our house. They live two doors now. And so these people live there. And this lady saw me at the end of a week. She was getting ready to leave. And they stayed there and they ministered in a number of churches. And, and she said, you know, I was praying and asking God why He gave you a single man a full, a 2,000 square foot, full bedroom, two bath house, which He gave me for, you know. I wrote a check for it. I wrote a check for it. I mean, I, I just, when they told me what they were going to sell it to me for, I just like, I just said, hmm? And so I said, fine. And uh, the, uh, praise the Lord Jesus. But she said, you know, he said, he's here all by himself. And he said, the Spirit of God spoke to me. And he says, no, he's not here by himself. All of the Son of the Holy Ghost live here with him. Well, actually, he said, Jesus the, Jesus the Father and I live here with Him. And you know, it says that if you keep my commandments, we will come and make our abode with you. That light verse came to life when you said that to me. That I know that in my house, they live there. They live there with me. And when I walk in that place at night, perfect peace settles down. I thank you for it, Lord Jesus. You know, people... God will bless you. I was sitting out in front of my house one day, and this man I knew that used to work at the military school came by. And he was in charge of the swimming pool down there. This is an old Cape Art housing development that was attached to an Air Force base. And I was renting a house out there. And he came by, and I spoke to him, and I asked him how he's doing, and so forth. He said, so, you know, I think about buying a house out here. I said, really nice out here. I know everybody out here. I've been taking care of their children, or them, or their children, or take care of their grandchildren. I said, I think I'm going to live out here. He said, well, why don't you buy this one over here? Doc? Don't buy that one. I said, that one up here. Said, oh, not that one, Doc. That's a bad house. This one over here has never had been lived in. It's a real nice house. It's got all the draperies, all the carpet in it. It's got these new Crestwood cabinets. It's got new units. We used it as a model home some years ago, and it's been locked up ever since. We used it as the office. It's this beautiful house. It's the wallpaper sort of falling off the front, off the living room wall, but you can fix that. So what they want for I don't know. They ain't priced it yet. And so he gave me the name of a lady, and I went down to the office, and I talked to him. He said, well, yeah, and so she took me all through the place and showed me all these places, and he showed me this one. I said, yeah, I'm going to take this one. I like it. I just got perfect peace. And so I went down, and so I said, well, I have to ask her what she wants for. And she said, what do you want to sell it for? I said, well, it's Dr. Noel right here, and he wants to buy it. Dr. William Noel? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, yeah, he, he's out here, and he wants to buy it. I said, well, what's the tax evaluation? She told her. Sell it for that. For that? She said, yeah, sell it for that. And so she came out and told me what she wanted. I said, go ask if she'll take my check. And she said, uh, and she came out. She said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, ma'am. When I came to town, my granddaughter and her daughter were with me, and they got very ill. My daughter became very ill. We took her to the emergency room. And they couldn't find any doctors to come see her. And so one of the nurses came through and said, well, I know somebody who comes see her. And said, so she called you. said, you got up and came down immediately. 
that there were people who were passing through town that didn't have a doctor and the child was very sick. I said, my child had meningitis. My granddaughter had meningitis and he took care of it. Don't you remember that? 20 years ago, you know, I said, well, ma'am, no, I, I really don't. I said, I've all, all, it's always been my policy if someone was really sick and passing through town didn't have a doctor, I'd come see Because I know what it's like to be passing through those strange places. Not going to die. And she said, I'd give you that house if I could. But it's not mine to give you, but I can sell it to you for that. Thank you, ma'am. And you know what? I took left it, and I made the mistake of telling the elder and another at the church elder down the street what they'd done. He went down and cussed them out. How dare you sell that witch doctor? That, that house for that? I thought, I had prayed for him. I said, oh, God, help me. But uh, that's how I got the house. But God will bless you. I say to you, God will bless you. When you live with a clear conscience before God and man, make it right, best you can. And don't live for the world. Don't love money. And then live for Him. Don't feel for you. sorry for yourself when adversity has died. I have adversity in my life. Don't you ever think I had not had adversity and that I haven't had bad things happen to me. And I've had to lay on my face for hours saying, Oh, God, help me. I, I don't want to sit here and delay them all, but I say to you this, God has carried me through every one of them. And I've stood before men, and I've stood before tribunals. That's okay. God has carried me through because of the deliverance ministry. Praise Him, people. Read the Word, praise Him, and strive to keep a clear conscience. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. All God's folks said. The closing, if anybody wants prayer, come up, we'll pray for you. I want to give a little testimony about not looking back. I've never done it exactly like I'm going to right now. But when we came when we came here, we were sought after and well-known, both Irma and I, in the aerospace and the missile industry. And the last job we had here in November and December before we came here in March and April, we made, we made $2,000 a week was our, was our wage that we left. And we could have stayed there and kept on making wages like that or similar to that, but the Lord called us here. And after we were here, the end of July, come here, we got a phone call one day. I got a phone call from, from, from Northrop, Northrop Aircraft, where both Irma and I had worked before. And the head of the proposal division or department called and wanted to know if I could come back and work for maybe three months on a job that they had that they needed my help on. And I told him, no, I, I couldn't do that. He said, well, we'll take care of you. I said, well, I appreciate that. But uh, and this, boy was a man, this particular man was a Christian. And I said, you know, the Lord's called us. Give me the vision for this to come here. And he's called us here. And uh, I just can't, can't do that. So I don't remember if it was the same day or the next day or two. But I got a call from the from the uh, uh, plant superintendent of Northrop, and he said, uh, uh, "Glenn, uh, we need you out here. We've got a job. We need your help on. Uh, come and help us." He said, "We'll pay your way, give you an apartment, take care of you." And uh, he said, "We need your help." I said, "No, I I can't do that. I've." The Lord's brought me back here. We've got just just got here. We've got this, and I can't do that. And it wasn't. A, I, I think it was all the same day. I got a call from the vice president of Northrop Aircraft, and he said, "Glenn, how much do we have to pay you to get you to come and help us?" I said, "You can't pay me enough to come and help you, because God's called me here, and I can't come. I have to stay here." But you see, I had an opportunity to look back. And it, was, it wasn't just, a, it was 
three times to try to convince me. That, and he, he said, how much do I have to pay you? I could have named my price and looked back. But God brought me here, and here's where I came, and here's where I stayed. And that's the truth with all, every one of you. It's so easy to look back to what could have been. But it's not what it could have been. It's what we're called to today. Amen. Anything else to add, Doc? Is that it? Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your anointing that rests here and that you brought here. And for all that you bring here from day to day and week to week and month to month. That come and go, receive and carry with them. We pray your blessings over those who have been here over the many years. That the fruit shall remain. And I praise you and I thank you for it. Now again, I pray your blessings on all who travel and on Doc Father as he has to travel and, and be on duty tomorrow. I thank you for your protection, the angel of the Lord with him, Father, that there be no problem as he travels. And others who will be traveling today, in Jesus' name, amen. Father, bless the food that Terry and then the others have prepared for us for lunch today. Make it health to us, in Jesus' name, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.